Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today online and in person. My name is Sonia Del Cepedo, and I am one of the three Lionside chat uh, moderators. And today I would like to um, welcome you to this collaboration between the Haas Colloquium and the Lionside Chats. And I am going to introduce a Dr. Keisha Morant Williams, who will introduce our speaker. Okay. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, today we have with us Dr. Jessica Schacher. Uh, Jessica is an Associate Professor of Social Studies Education and Women's Studies here at Penn State Berks. She teaches several courses in the education program as well as general, general education classes in women's history and critical race theory. Dr. Schacher integrates research, teaching, and service, service projects, um, and they're based on promoting social justice in urban education. She and her students have been involved in a number of service learning and community-based research projects within the Reading School District and the greater Reading community. Her other scholarly interests include the teaching of women's history with images and primary sources, documents, and inclusion of women of color in history curriculum. And then uh, specifically for today, uh, this presentation will outline the results of one of her studies uh, that she conducted on a cohort of women's history students, and it's linked to Anne Louise's 1968 memoir, Coming of Age in Mississippi. And so we're very excited to have with us today, particularly during our Women's History Month, Dr. Jessica Shaw. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you to the Lions Side Chat team for making this possible. And special thank you to all of you who are here in the room and um, online the Friday before spring break. I mean, really the kudos goes to you. So I'm just really happy to have an audience and happy to share some of this work with you today. Um, so here's what we're going to do um, in this hour. I'm going to share a little bit of background for why I did this study, tell you a little about the book that I teach in my women's history class, tell you a little about the class and my positioning as the teacher, and then I'll go through the study itself and uh, take some questions at the end. And this research was just published in May of last year in the History of Teacher. So for those of you who are interested in the whole article, you can find it online. Uh, thehistoryteacher.org, or you can email me and I would be happy to send you a copy of the paper. I also note at the bottom here that I love questions. I love being interrupted. So please do not hesitate, even in the middle of the presentation, to wave a hand, or if you're on Zoom and you have a question, uh, send me us monitoring that. So I love to be interrupted and uh, want it to be interesting and engaging for you. So if there's something in particular that you want to ask about, please jump in. Uh, so a little bit of background. This research was conducted in Women's History uh, 117, which is a modern women's history class. So we usually start like late 1800s and move as close as we can toward the present. I don't teach history in a perfect chronology. I like to teach more by theme, uh, but that's kind of the context of the class. And it's a women's history class. So when I started teaching it, I used to assume that my students had a basic understanding of general American history, right, which is men's history, right? <laughs> um, but what I found was that my students really were lacking a lot of just basic content knowledge. Like if I would talk about the women's movement, they didn't really know like where in American history that even happened. So I found that I was really not teaching women's history, but rather I was teaching history through the eyes of women and the mouths of women instead of through the eyes and mouths of men. So I really consider my class an American history class. It's just told by and about women. Um, and really it's very humanizing, I, I believe, to teach history through traditionally marginalized groups, stories. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that shortly. I also want to briefly acknowledge the fact that I'm about to give a talk about teaching Black women's history, and uh, particularly a Black woman's memoir, and I have white skin. So my positionality matters here, and I acknowledge that even though I am a scholar of Black history, I still live in white skin. So there are knowledges and understandings that I cannot have, no matter how much I read or how much I study. So that is an important component as well. And as a teacher, in order to gain my students' trust, 
this is something I have to revisit with the students throughout the semester. So I want to tell you just briefly about the text. Um, has anyone read Coming of Age in Mississippi in the room or online? <laughs> I think we have a couple. We have one attendee I know online who's read it. Um, so Anne Moody's memoir takes place in uh, Mississippi, in rural Mississippi. She's born in 1940, and her book is divided up into four parts. I'm going to pass the book around in case you're curious to page through it. So the book is uh, starts with her childhood, her earliest memories when she's about four years old, high school, college, and then her time working in the civil rights movement. What I find interesting about teaching memoir is that we're, we're uh, relying on memory to tell our story. And as all of you know, your memories of your own life are fraught. They are colored by what has happened around you and by perspective and relationships. So I always remind students that this is Anne's story according to her. And this story will look different depending on who's telling it. And that's part of what I love about history. Like I just gave myself the goosebumps. I'm such a nerd about this. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I always remind them that memoir gives us a chance to see history through one person's lens. Okay, so just a second, I'll read just a little bit here. All right, so I'm going to tell you about some of the scholarship that I used to frame um, this study. So the two main theoretical frameworks that I use in most of my research are Black feminist thought and critical race theory. Um, I'm also in the discipline of social studies education. So a lot of the scholarship that I read is in about how we teach this content to students, kindergarten through 12th grade and beyond, even here in college. And scholars in social studies education typically agree that teaching American history requires a centering of race and racism. That if we leave that out of the narrative, we're not really teaching American history because it has had such a dominant place in the shaping um, of American history. Further, scholars in critical race theory, particularly bell hooks, suggest we need to disrupt the idea of a safe space for learning. So you've probably heard teachers at some point say, this is a safe space. I want you to feel comfortable here. I actually said the opposite. This is not a safe space. I can't guarantee that for you. I'm teaching you about race and racism, and I can't tell you that I'm not gonna ever bring about emotion in you. And once we kind of accept that we're stepping into this brave space where we're talking about things that might make us uncomfortable and we are vulnerable, that is where the real learning can happen. So that really frames my class. Not only is this space not necessarily safe for my students, it's not necessarily safe for me either as the teacher. And that's okay. That's where learning happens. In critical race theory, there's an emphasis on counter story, which is the concept of um, providing a different narrative or a different version of the same series of events. Um, that's also sometimes referred to as revisionist history, which gets a bad rep or changing the past. That's not what it really is. It's really just adding to the history so that it is more complete and includes all of the experiences of folks who are traditionally not included in what's often referred to as a master narrative. So I like to do this exercise with my students. I'll do it with you really briefly where I ask you to close your eyes and imagine the author of your high school American history textbook reading to you. He's reading to you, oh, I just gave one part of it away, from the book, <laughs> and what does the author look like? Well, uh, raise your hand and tell me what the author of your American textbook looks like. Val, yeah. an old white man. <laughs> right, white hair, glasses, and an armchair, right? I always get that response, right? So revisionist history is just what would happen if the narrator looked different. What would happen if the narrator had different experiences? And that's what revisionist history is. I also teach with an awareness of intersectionality, which is the idea that we are not monolithic people. I'm a white woman, but I have many other uh, facets to my identity 
And the women that I teach about are not just black women, black men, white men. Uh, there's many, many identity factors that create a human being. And we need to get away in history and in the mainstream discussion from labeling people by one monolithic identity. And the research shows that we are still teaching out of the textbook in most places. So in high school, even in college, we're still kind of relying on textbooks. So I try to get away from that by teaching from memoir, teaching from pictures to um, kind of get away from that master narrative. Okay, so I know that this is why some of y'all are here because you're learning about research methods. <laughs> so I got a whole slide for you. Um, so I use the theoretical um, methodology, the research methodology of phenomenology, which really just talks about how students begin to develop. This is my research question. I'm looking at how students begin to develop and demonstrate an understanding of both race and the experiences of women in history by studying the autobiography of Anne Moody, which is coming of age in Mississippi. So yes, I'm teaching about the history. Yes, I'm concerned about the content and the greater understanding of the civil rights movement and you know, 1940s through 1960s America. But I'm also really interested in how my students are understanding race and gender in the present. And I believe history can give us a lens to understand the present. Um, those concepts are understood uniquely by students as a result of their personal experiences. So in my class, when we read this book, we read it differently depending on our lived experiences, the color of our skin, and how we were raised. So Bagel suggests that phenomenology explores, and I love this book, so I will read it verbatim, how people are connected meaningfully in the world. Phenomenologists are interested in trying to slow down and open up how things are experienced. That is, the world as it is lived, not the world as it is measured. So although I have plenty of experience with quantitative research and statistics, I was really happy to delve into the phenomenology world and just allow the content to reveal itself to me. I ended up with 36 student participants in a 2017 cohort of this class, including six men, the rest were women. And about a third of my students were students of color, and the, there's detailed breakdown by race in the article itself. So I'm not going to read all of these, but I wanted to show you that each section of the book, the four sections, has a reading guide where I give students really specific questions to talk about uh, what they're learning about Anne throughout the book. So I picked a few parts that I'm going to highlight for you here from part one. And by talking about the book, I'm not giving it away. So I really hope that you all will read it. <laughs> this is not like spark notes, like you get so much from actually reading the book. Um, so I always start off by asking my students just to track what they find interesting, right? So as they're reading the book, like put in a post-it note, highlight something, bring it to class so that we can talk about it. Um, I want them to highlight, I want them to bookmark pages. I also ask them to create a character outline, which you may have done in your literature classes where you have to identify who all the characters are. That's number two. What I love about the early part of the book is Anne Moody has an ability to go back into her young self and see the way she saw the world when she was young. And at the beginning, she identifies these early experiences she has. She's born Essie May Moody, by the way. So you'll see Essie May a lot. She doesn't change her name to Anne until she's in college. And for example, she opens the book by telling the story of sitting on her front patio. This is in the 1940s in Mississippi. So her family is sharecroppers, which means they're living on the, the land of white landowners, what was formerly worked by enslaved people in many ways. Some scholars would argue that her family is still enslaved um, because they're being pulled into the, to the landowners, right? So she's sitting on her patio and the sun is setting. Her family has just come in from a long day's work. You know, her older sibling, sorry, she's the oldest, her, her parents, her younger sister Adeline is there with her. And as it gets darker and darker and darker, her house descends into the darkness and the house on the hill where the white family lives is lit by bright light. And you get this like very vivid imagery of her childhood. 
And that's how she comes to know what race means. They have light. We live in the dark. When her family would bring home scraps of food that were thrown out after the white folks ate dinner, she would say, wow, I can't believe what they eat. You know, we eat bread and beans. They eat colorful food. And she would write about it in this very detailed way. So I asked the students here in number three to start just writing down these details because understanding the meaning of skin color, right, is an accumulating series of actual personal experiences that happen from the time we're small to the time that we are adults. And these are experiences that a lot of white children never experience, not in the present, not in the past. Because if you're sitting in the light, you don't notice the families that are descending into the darkness. Um, so we'll, we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Um, I also asked some questions about um, Essie Mays or Anne's relationship with her mother, which is a theme throughout the story. You know, Anne grows up to become a civil rights activist. Her mom ends up being completely uninvolved, just discouraging Anne from participating in civil rights um, movements. And that's a really interesting relationship that she starts detailing when she's young. Um, she also writes a lot about how Black women, particularly her mother, were always working. And I really want my students to pay attention to how Black women work because they've always worked. And a lot of my students in their traditional mainstream white history classes have learned women didn't work, right? Women stayed home. They were homemakers. Black women have always worked in various capacities. So I want them to start teasing that out that the uh, master narrative depiction of women as homemakers is a, is a pretty white-centric idea. Okay, still with me so far? <laughs> okay, so then in the second part of the book, um, I'm just gonna pick two parts of this to highlight. So she's in high school. Anne Moody is just about the same age as Emmett Till, who um, some of you may know. I hope you do. If you don't, that's your homework, right? To go Google what happened to Emmett Till, who was a, a young, um, boy who was murdered violently for supposedly whistling at a white woman in a convenience store. Uh, it was later proven that he didn't do this. Um, about, I don't know, what, five, six years ago, the woman that he supposedly whistled at came forward and said, it never happened. So neither here nor there, whether he whistled or not, right? He didn't. Anyway, so this news just hit Anne really hard because here's a boy her age nearby that has this just you know horrific um, murder and she tries to talk about it at school and she tries to talk about it with her mom and all the elders in her life are like no 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 don't talk about this this is dangerous just be quiet and she does not understand why they can't talk about it um, so I want my students to really explore what does it mean for a young black child when they see injustice and their elders are telling them not to confront that injustice? Um, she also writes a lot about her segregated school. Okay, so she's in school in the late 40s, early 50s. What major Supreme Court's happening, Supreme Court cases happening around here? Around the board. Right, so she's living in the era of trying to integrate schools. And the way that this story is written in our mainstream history textbooks is as a trial, right? The schools were segregated. That was terrible. Look at these brave children that are crossing the line and they're going to school. Yay, everything's better. And Anne tells us that is not her experience whatsoever. Right? It took many, many years after Brown v. Board was passed for schools to even begin to integrate. This is a story for another day. And once schools integrated, it was not all rainbows and butterflies. So it's very interesting to hear Anne talk about her experiences in school. Okay, and in part three in college, um, she goes to two different HBCUs. Um, that was all that was accessible to her um, in the South. And she uh, went to Natchez first, where she has her first experience of activism. And it's because there were like maggots in the rice that they were eating. And she was just horrified that nobody was doing anything about this. 
And um, so she protested. It didn't amount to much. And she realized what an uphill battle she had facing her. So she ended up leaving um, Natchez College, believing this isn't where I'm going to make a difference. And she went to Tuvalu College in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, where there was an active um, NAACP chapter, an active SNCC chapter, and she was able to get involved with um, the civil rights movement. This is where she starts to feel optimistic. You know, she's surrounded by people who want to make a change in the South, in the United States, and she's excited. Um, she also tries to do an impromptu sit-in. So you may have learned about the sit-in movement when you were at school in a, probably a watered-down way, um, but where students would just sit, literally, in places where they were not welcome. Like, oh, this is a segregated lunch counter? Well, I'm just going to sit here until you send in law enforcement to pick me up and take me away. And we saw sit-ins at pools and at libraries and at other public spaces as well. So Anne tries to do this with her friend Rose at a train station where they were trying to get on a train and they sat in a white section and it was a disaster because they didn't plan it ahead of time. And what she learned is that civil rights action doesn't just organically happen. Um, and this is a very important lesson for students as well, because they're told the story of Rosa Parks, a tired seamstress who one day just decided she didn't want to give up her seat. And that's not at all what happened. Rosa Parks was a high ranking member of the NAACP who planned for months exactly the day and how she was going to stay in her seat. It was a coordinated effort that took many, many folks, and she wasn't the first, as a matter of fact. The first who did it was a young single mom who the movement decided was not the right face for civil rights. Um, so I want the students to start to see, like, civil rights work took an incredible movement effort, and Anne really details that here. There's also some very interesting um, narratives in part three of the story where she talks about race on campus. And when she goes to Tuvalu College and she's a dark-skinned Black woman, she's really nervous about colorism, about um, her lighter-skinned Black peers not accepting her. And she, um, there's a quote, well, I'm going to read that to you later, where she you know, kind of works through some of these concerns that she has, which are valid and continue to be valid for people of color today. Okay, uh, and then in part four, and I know that you probably can't read this because it's too small, so I'm just going to tell you a few parts about it. Um, so the first thing I want to tell you is that once Anne got involved in the civil rights movement, she just accepted that going to jail was going to be a regular part of her life. So she and her peers would work out like, oh, I have a midterm next week. I can't go to jail, so I'm sorry. I can't go to this event. And they would figure out when they could go to civil rights events based on who had the, the physical time to go to jail. And they would usually end up in jail until the jail got too full, and then they would be released. My students are like bananas over this. Mm -hmm. Like, they can't believe it. And like, this was just such a normal part of activism um, that they don't learn about. So that's part one that I would really like to um, talk about. Um, I also show this famous image, which some of you might be familiar with. I'm just gonna give you a minute to digest it. So if you've seen it before, I encourage you, like, look again, like, look closely. Look at Anne Moody's hair, just like covered with some combination of mustard and salt and vinegar. Look at the sleeves of her professor, John Salter, sitting there on the left of the screen. You can see ketchup on the shirt of her friend, John Trumpauer, her first ever white friend um, who is uh, very committed to civil rights and works together with Anne in this particular sit-in, the 1963 sit-in at the Jackson, Mississippi Woolworths. And behind them is this like angry mob of mostly young white high school boys. It took hours of this heckling um, physical abuse before Anne and her um, comrades were, were dragged, not just carried, but dragged by their legs. She details what it feels like to feel your body dragged across the floor 
to be pulled out and arrested. This is just another view here. This is before one of the angry uh, folks back there took Joan Trenkauer's glasses. So she still has her glasses here. If you look at other pictures to get back right black well this day, you can see at some point there's somebody playing with her glasses. And you know, this is just one sit-in. They happened all over the country. And um, so my students read about her firsthand experience at this um, sit-in. I just spend a lot of time with this picture. Uh, she writes about, um, she leaves Jackson and she goes back to the rural part of Mississippi where she grew up to try to register voters. And this is where she starts to become more demoralized. So she's optimistic when she starts college. And then as she enters her early 20s and she's trying to register four black voters to vote. And they're terrified to vote for good reason. Because sometimes when black voters would show up to vote, they would face violence. Uh, they were worried about the safety of their children, just, just let us live our lives, right? And so she would spend hours upon hours on foot, knocking on doors, trying to convince black voters to register to vote. And while she's doing this, she's not safe. There's groups that are coming after her. Um, there's many threats to her safety. She often has to hide in the woods, and not the woods, she's in Mississippi Delta, hide in the marsh, <coughs> and so on. So she's very, very exhausted. And she talks about like one day where she slept for 24 hours and it was a combination of physical exhaustion and just outright depression. Um, so it really talks about how this civil rights movement, which is often told as this like triumphant story of success uh, was not all triumphant. And many historians might argue it was more not triumphant than it was actually triumphant which is a really radical and disruptive kind of idea for many of my students to hear for the first time. I should also say, um, when I say that it's radical and disruptive, that's usually for my white students. My students of color are like a lot less shocked. And there's also a lot of research that shows that my students of color just have more psychological stamina for this um, kind of revisionist history and hearing these stories than my students of color. And I see that play out anecdotally in my classes all the time, where white students are, are saddened, they feel betrayed, they're hurt, they don't believe it, uh, they want to push back. And um, it's certainly something that adds an interesting dynamic in class where I want to uh, help my students understand and work through those feelings, but I also want to honor that we must keep pushing forward and studying the history as Anne is telling it to us. Um, a couple other things I focus on are the role of young people in the civil rights movement. My students really like hearing this because my students are college students. So many of them feel motivated to action when they take classes where they learn about history. And um, so they learn about you know, college student organization, which is also really cool. Um, the last thing that we talk about before I get into data analysis is the final line of the book. Um, thanks, I'm going to read it to you. So, spoiler alert, but it doesn't ruin the book. <laughs> this book does not finish optimistically. Um, when Anne publishes the book in her 20s, that's it. She never does media appearances. Um, she died, I think, in 2015 or 16, something like that. She never spoke to the media. She, she was disillusioned. She gave up. And um, she went to the March on Washington. She was physically there when Martin Luther King delivered, I have a dream. And her response to that was blah, blah, blah. You have a dream and I'm on my feet exhausted. And so the students also are often very triggered by this, right? Because they love that speech. And everybody quotes that speech as you know this aspirational, well, as something we've actually achieved and should live by not as an aspirational idea of what could be, right? So that can be very tough. So she's at the end of the book, she's sitting on a bus with a whole bunch of college students who are now younger than her, she's a little older, and they're all singing, we will overcome, which is a traditional freedom song. And she writes, well, okay, so she's here with this little young kid and he writes, Moody, it was little Jean again, interrupting with the singing. Moody, we're going to get things straight in Washington, huh? And she says, I didn't answer him. I knew I didn't have to. He looked as if he knew exactly what I was thinking. 
I wonder, I wonder, we shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. I wonder, I really wonder. And then she ends the book and she's gone from the scene. So what do we do with that, right? I have students that are frustrated, bummed, they're sad. And we really have to unpack what that means and what Anne's work and legacy meant. Did it mean something? Did it not? That's where we can really have a, a really good deliberation and a discussion and disagree there a little bit. So let me tell you about how, that's how I taught the class, basically, a lot of small groups. So my students would submit their responses to these questions to me. I wrote all of them detailed written feedback. Some of my students are here, you know I do this, right? I'm notorious for writing paragraphs and paragraphs and then being like, hey, I wrote you feedback and I didn't hear from you. Can you, can you respond? <laughs> so there's dialogue in our feedback. So that's one of my data sources is I got their permission to use their writing, but also to use our dialogue. So when I would respond with a question and the student would answer my question, that's part of my, um, my data for this phenomenological study. I also took notes while I was teaching. So I'd walk around with a legal pad, I'd take notes. I'd try to quote students as I circulated the room to write down things they said. And then I took notes on my notes. And I tried to color code and find themes emerging in what students were saying. So I have a combination here of narrative data and numerical data, because there were some things I could quantify. Like out of my 37 participants or 36 participants, I remember the number 31 of them wrote in detail about the lights at the beginning of the book, right? So like that really means something. That's a striking moment in the book. So there were parts there I were able to quantify. But at the end of the day, I had so much data, like an unbelievable amount of data, like I'm still sitting on it, wondering what to do with the rest of it. So I really had to balance how much I wanted to cover with what I wanted to cover in depth, which is the like conundrum of a qualitative researcher. Like, what do you do? Like, what do you choose to focus on? For those of you that are in a research methods class. So I ended up writing up a 50 page essay. I probably could have written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. <laughs> on this data. So three themes emerged from my research, which I'm going to share with you. Um, so the first is that students learned how race works. So how race as a construct to shape material consequences and human welfare. Um, and during the, the first part of the book in particular, the students were just really, really surprised um, to read Anne's concrete, very simple explanations um, of how uh, her family's life experiences were different. Um, so in unapologetic detail, I'm just going to read from my paper for a second, bear with me, this is something academics do. Um, in unapologetic detail, Moody provides numerous specifics of how, as a young child, she came to understand how race made her reality. Several of these stories showed up regularly in my students' submission. Um, so I already told you about the one with darkness. This anecdote told early in the memoir certainly resonated with the majority of my students. Twelve students referenced Moody's recollection of her mother bringing home leftovers from the home of the white family that she worked for. Moody described how they lived on beans and bread and often felt hungry. Several students quoted Moody when she said, Mama would bring us the white family's leftovers. It was the best food I'd ever eaten. That was when I discovered white folks ate different from us. 16 students recounted Moody's anecdote about wandering into the white section of the movie theater and her mother's subsequent panic and admonishment. One student wrote, for example, the experience at the theater exposed Essie to the differences in quality of life between white people and people of color. Another said, mama grabbed Essie and scared her at the theater. She didn't even know that she was doing anything wrong. So they're starting to see how children just being children were then taught by their parents very quickly what race meant. Um, and <clears throat> I could go on about that, but time. So as Moody's book progresses through her life, she provides even more concrete examples. So there's a fire at one point, a fire in a black family's home that was clearly set deliberately by arson. And a student wrote, everyone knew the fire didn't happen because a kerosene lamp fell and that white people were behind it. But but Moody's neighbors felt powerless to speak up. 
The student is demonstrating her understanding of the structure of power, which limited the ability of Black people to speak out against injustice. Another student said, SMA said the FBI dropped the investigation as soon as public attention died down. That still happens today. His ability to make a connection to the present shows that by processing this information in the past, he was able to make better connections to the present. Um, okay, so I mentioned earlier about colorism. Um, so I had a lot of really interesting um, data about how the students processed reading all of this. One student wrote in her reading guide, for example, Mama told Essie that if a child was born to a white daddy and a colored mama, the child will still be labeled as colored. She then brought this up, same student, in a whole group discussion, and she was really just stuck on this. And so I taught my students about the one drop rule, which is one of several moments in class where I recall students, particularly my white students, being flabbergasted. This is an example of how the history that they learned in high school was incomplete. Um, so I had students read a chapter from Beverly Tatum's book, Why Are All the Black Children Sitting Together in a Cafeteria, which is a great primer on race for those who need, like, what's the first book I should read about this. And um, so they learned about how even among communities of color, there's a, a racial hierarchy by lightness and darkness. Um, this was helpful to a majority of my students who were struggling to make sense of Moody's use of terms such as yellow and high yellow to describe the, the coloring of her black friends and peers. Um, for example, when Moody is planning her transfer to Tupelo College, a friend says to her, baby, you're too black. You got to be high yellow with a rich ass daddy. This quote was mentioned by students in both written submissions and in class. Um, okay, and the last part on this theme is I started to notice another pattern emerging. My students noticed that they were explicitly talking about race. And this is something that they didn't have a lot of experience doing before coming to the class. Um, they said it was something that they weren't comfortable with. One student said, I've always felt really curious about people who have two races, like if they feel white or black but I didn't know how to ask anyone about that without sounding racist. Another said, well, I was told it isn't PC to talk about race. So we just dance around it like it's not there, but it totally is. These are quotes from students in class. A black female student said, it's weird to be in a classroom and be the only black person. So they're having this human moment of connection. This happens to me sometimes here at Penn State. I think Anne was just afraid that she was going to be all alone at Tuvalu. So the students are connecting with each other in the present at Penn State Works through hearing about the experiences of this young woman in Mississippi in the late 1950s, early 1960s. So these comments during small group discussion were very common. And I noticed what seemed to me, the researcher in my white skin, as relief on both the parts of my students of color and my white students to be actually talking about the proverbial elephant in the room, right? It's 2017, Trump had just been inaugurated, um, Charlottesville um, happens in 2017. So race is like on the minds, the black, Colin Kaepernick is taking a knee during that football season, right? Race is like in the public discussion. Okay, second theme. We're almost done, we're gonna get to Q&A. <laughs> Second theme is that students explored specifically the experiences of black women prior to and during the civil rights movement. If I asked my students, like, what do you know about women in the civil rights movement? They all said unanimously the same thing. Rosa Parks, right? So they were able to hear other stories. And in many cases, they learned that women built, I mean, okay, a little bit of bias. Women built the civil rights movement. And a lot of scholars will agree. Um, that women did a lot of the organizing and oftentimes men did speaking and a lot of the public um, work, but women were often behind the scenes making a lot of that work happen. Um, and I asked students as I was walking around the room, did you ever imagine women as part of any political movement in history? <laughs> they were like so surprised. <laughs> and after a pause for thought, some shook their heads no, others seemed unsure. I followed this up by connecting to content earlier in the semester when we learned about women's political action during the suffrage movement, albeit to the exclusion of black women. 
Black women's participation in retail store boycotts during the Great Depression and many other examples of women being politically active. I asked them, why do you think you don't think about women, particularly Black women, as agents of political action? And they really liked this question. Like, it was one of those classes that got derailed, and I didn't cover what I wanted to cover, but it was great <laughs> because um, they started saying things like, well, then you have Black women like Anne's mama, who doesn't want to get involved at all and upholds things the way they are. So I pushed them to think about why that was and the complexity of why Anne's mother didn't feel like she could participate in the movement. Also, in this last part, one of the most important themes that came through was really understanding the relationship between communities of color and law enforcement. So I had a lot of criminal justice majors in the class this semester, a couple that wanted to be cops in particular, so it was really good to have um, them in the class because it really elevated the discussion. So a great deal of time was spent in class talking about the dysfunctional relationship between communities of color and law enforcement. My students wrote nearly unanimously about how surprised they were to hear about Anne going to jail, for example. Um, one of my students in the class in particular was in her senior year as a criminal justice major preparing to pursue a career as a state trooper. And at one point she said in small group discussion, I feel like a lot of people don't realize that black people and cops have always had issues. And a group member responded, really? How can you not realize that with Black Lives Matter on TV and all of our social media? And the first student replied, I know, I know, but they don't know the history, so they don't get it. And this response indicated that this student understood the value of learning the history so that she could be a better officer and understand those relationships. Could have been a bit of a leap, but I like to optimistically think that this comment suggests that she understands that importance. It is perhaps noteworthy that this group um, included a diverse group, which I think shows that when students are working with students who don't just look like them and share uh, the same life experiences because of their race, they're able to reach empathy on a deeper level. So I decided to pursue that particular conversation in whole group, where in the book I, I pulled um, and lists like their demands in one of the sit-ins that they participated in. This is what we demand. It was like hiring black police officers, removing segregation signs, um, encouraging restaurants to serve black people, integrating parks and libraries, um, integrating service stations, etc. And I asked the students if that seemed reasonable. And like they thought that was funny. And I'm asking it seriously, like, are these reasonable demands, right? We put them on the screen and they're saying, yes, of course, they're reasonable. And I said, right, but so much of the country did not think that these were reasonable and we have to we have to get past incredulity and try to understand why these demands were seen as unreasonable so then i pulled up the platform of the black lives matter movement much more mm -hmm. controversial right mm -hmm. and i said what's reasonable what are we going to think in 50 years 100 years because 50 100 years ago what we thought was reasonable is completely different, right? So it was a great opportunity for the students to connect to the present. All right, let's see what's really important that's left here. Okay, theme three. Um, the third big movement uh, or big theme was that the civil rights movement was not a triumph in a full extent. And dealing with disappointment and there, and then what to do with that disappointment, right? Because you have a choice. You can sit and wallow and give up, or you can do something with it. And both have valid reasons, right? Um, as Anne shows us. So I really wanted the students to decide for themselves what to do with this information. Um, so a few things I'll say um, about this. Uh, for example, in whole group discussion, I asked them about their reactions, and the room was quiet, and the students looked sad and uncomfortable. So as skillful teachers do when students don't reply to a prompt in whole group setting, I sent them to small groups where I thought they would talk. So I circulated the room. I heard a lot of comments about their disappointment. One in particular, I just always thought everything got better after the civil rights movement, a white female student said. She continued, Hannah's so unhappy at the end of the book, like she feels she failed. And a black female student responded to her, well, she did fail. And that student said, why didn't we learn about this in high school? And that's really where I got um, 
like some, I noticed a fire being lit for a lot of my students. Like, why didn't we learn about this sooner? And that's true with so much, right? Like Christopher Columbus, Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. right? It's like you learn the, the full truth later and you have to like look for it. It doesn't come and find you. Um, so we talked about how that could be something they could do, right? Um, physically actually do is teach the real history. I had a lot of education majors in the group as well. Um, their disappointment was not only at the end, but also throughout the book. You know, hearing about what happened with Emmett Till and how she couldn't talk about it, um, hearing all of the things that she couldn't talk about. Um, this is a, a written response from a Black student who said, I go back and forth. I've always wondered how could Black people allow themselves to be treated so poorly and never challenge it. But I also get it. If nothing gets better, why do you try? Moody shows us that many, if not all, were aware of what was happening to them was wrong. But during those times, people in society just constantly normalized that way of life and made it hard for them to rebel or change the injustices. I have to admit, I sometimes feel like that now. This response for me was indicative of her inner struggle with making sense of history and present. And I followed up with her one-on-one -on -one and I've kept up with her over the years to see how she's doing. And I explicitly asked her if she felt like the book helped her make sense of her struggles as a college student who's trying to be an activist. She's graduated now, but she said, yeah, it did. It was validating. So if nothing else, um, reading a history that resonates with you, even if it doesn't end the way you want, um, can serve a purpose. So for what to do with this knowledge, um, I was particularly impressed with how my students talked about Martin Luther King. I'm not interested in like, dragging Martin Luther King through the mud, right? Someone can be a hero and also be imperfect and flawed, right? Like both of those things can be true at the same time. Um, but students said things like, everyone quotes that speech today, like it's all come true or something. I realize now that's kind of embarrassing. That was interesting. Um, so many small groups discussed the King's speech and Moody's interpretation of it. They were especially interested in the examples I provided about how King's words have been co-opted all throughout history up to the present day and how misunderstood his words are without the context of the rest of his life and work. Um, so there are deep reflections about how King's speech is used today showed to me that this study of history mattered and that they would be able to take that into the present to more critically read the world around them. Further, it illustrates how studying history through the experiences of Black women in particular provides a lens for deeper understanding. So in general, my students seem to like the book. I think many of them even loved the book, even though it wasn't the easiest read for them. Um, and a lot of them asked for recommendations for other stories that they could read um, that talked about um, women's experiences, particularly Black women's experiences in the civil rights movement. So there's a couple things I talked about at the end. Um, I, I want to do more about teaching with memoir myself. I would encourage other teachers just memoir instead of textbooks. And you can juxtapose the stories with data and documents and primary sources, but to kind of get away from the master narrative of textbooks. Um, I also think I teach a lot of current events, politics type stuff too. I find history to be a great path to talk about the present because the present, um, because it's a highly charged world we live in. And sometimes putting things in the past takes away that current charge. And then when we do talk about the present, we've already built this intellectual lens and framework together and trust to talk about the content with empathy, with kindness, and with a willingness to learn. Um, I think this has implications for classroom practice in pre-K through 12, not just higher education. I think students uh, need to be exposed to this kind of memoir reading younger, and they're certainly capable, and there's wonderful children's books that even do this with pictures. Um, to make them developmentally appropriate. And I just want to highlight a few limitations of this study. Um, my colleagues who teach English have reminded me that I'm not a, a trained scholar teaching literature. So I'm teaching memoir and I'm not a professor of literature. So I do have to put that out there. Um, as a historian, I do believe we can teach with memoir, but certainly learning from our English colleagues along the way. Um, I said earlier, I had to make choices in the paper about which content to cover, which is certainly a limitation. And of course, as always, I'm always questioning my place in this space as a white person, as a white teacher, and what roles I can and should play and what roles I need to step back from. So that is my paper. <laughs> and I'd love to pivot now to some questions. 
And because I'm a teacher at heart, I also have some prompts for you. <laughs> so I'll share them and you can take them or leave them, but I'll just take your questions, um, whatever you want to know. So really, what do you want to know about the, the research? What do you want to know about? I just need to say that one more second. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. Any questions you have about this research, about my students, you know, what I can tell you without giving away their identities. Um, any Anything about this content or like about teaching history this way? I'll pause there because I've already got hands. Yeah. Um, I was thinking, you know, it's such a fine line in terms of white people learning uh, through the lens of critical race theory and and struggling with that white savior, like the tendency toward the white savior complex. Mm -hmm. uh, because I feel like I've seen incidences where white people think they're lifting up the black community yep. when in fact that's not their purpose. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm trying to figure out an appropriate way to, um, as a white teacher, um, instruct in a way that doesn't appear to be from the white senior complex perspective. And instead, um, what my role should be as an educator. <laughs> That makes sense. Yeah, it's a great question that I can't answer in, in nine minutes or, or, or nine years. So I'll just give a couple like quick responses. I think first of all, it's like uh, to use black voices or other voices of color. So I try to find work that's written by non-white authors and assign that. I think that's one way. So it's not like your job as the white person to tell students of color, people of color about their experiences. It is your job to elevate the voices that are already speaking. Um, so I like teaching Anne Louise's book because it's her story. So I hope I do her justice, right, by teaching her story, um, but they're her words at the end of the day. So I think that's probably my, my number one. And I think the idea that um, you use the word complex, like white savior complex, well, as soon as you use the word complex, you know it's not real. Like white people are not going to save people of color, right? It's a complex, it's not real, it's a construction. So I think even just naming that, Be sure to get it out there because I promise I would. <laughs> um, the audience member wants to know where they can view this and other research that you have conducted. Uh, Scholar.google.com. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> my name. Or if you're a Penn State student, um, you can search the Penn State libraries. I don't have a huge body of research. I've got six to eight articles. Um, and I try to um, write about what's most meaningful to me. So I'd be honored if you read my other work. And it's just more of a comment to, to piggyback on what you both were talking about. I think um, the way you position yourself in your work is important. And that, that speaks to the um, walking alongside a community rather than speaking for a community. So you said even just in this short time uh, that you're very aware and conscious that you are a white woman doing this work. And so looking at like reflexivity and looking at uh, how you're positioned in it, I think is an excellent way to, you know, to begin to address that. That reminds me too that I also tell the students, um, I talked about vulnerability at the beginning of the class. Um, I'm vulnerable with them. So I often tell them like, I'm here as your teacher, but when you trust me and let me teach you, then you become my teacher. I've said that to my students many times. And so um, just because I'm the academic intellectual leader of the room, I mean, that's even not even totally true, right? But just because I'm the one in the power with the grade book doesn't mean that I'm not learning also. So I think um, being willing to be a vulnerable learner also helps with that as well. Isn't there benefits to like taking away like the trying to conceive of like a civil rights movement? Like for example, if you said um, how um, the author of the book, how she suffered severe depression, and then also there's been um, articles out saying that like Martin Luther King, he experienced depression too, but he had to mask it. So with shifting away like this mask, trying to See, couldn't you say, like, with this, there are benefits to, like, uncovering, like, mental health issues, which is, like, a taboo within the black community? I mean, definitely, right? And I think that that's a future direction for this kind of research, is to look at the mental toll that um, socio-political conflict causes on individual people. 
and it manifests itself not just as depression and anxiety, but other diseases. I mean, the science is starting to show us that profoundly, clearly, uh, that race harms, race conflict harms all people, white people too. Mm -hmm. Um, and starting to explore that from a mental health perspective is, is something I hope we continue to see more of. If you, may, may I ask another question? Um, this is for me. <laughs> I'm just, I was sitting here listening to today's story that you shared with us and your experiences, and I just sit here and wonder how was she able to get the book published? Like, can you yeah. share, like, what can you share with us about that experience for Anne? You know, that's a great question. I don't totally remember. I feel like I read about her publishing of the book when I read her obituary, mm -hmm. believe it or not. I think that's like the first time I really read about it. So her New York Times obituary, if you Google that, talks about her whole life. It talks about her relationship with her sister Adeline. I didn't really even get into the stuff with her mom. I mean, it's really interesting. So I, I recommend reading that. But I think that she was North that she was like in the Northeast. I don't even know who published this book, but mm -hmm. if my memory is serving me correctly, she ended up living in Massachusetts, somewhere in the Northeast. And that is probably how she was able to get her book published. We actually have a comment that just came in um, from one of our attendees. As someone who has taken classes with Dr. Shocker, mm -hmm. it is also really helpful <laughs> that she focuses on discussion when learning about race, rather than informing us about those things as if she is an expert. We emphasize that there is always more to learn, which is great. It's not okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who this is, but thank you. <laughs> but that's true. I mean, I think like as teachers, we feel like we're supposed to know everything, and I have found it so liberating. So like, actually, the more I read and the more that I write, the, the less I know. Like, I'm really good at asking questions. I'm not as great at answering them. So a lot of times when students ask me questions, I'll come back. Oh, well, what about? What about this, right? Respond with the question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to, to the student. Andrew. Uh, I know that you mentioned that you kept in contact with some of your previous students from that class. Uh, have you seen any of their like activities post-graduation that have stemmed from the class and the readings that you gave? I can't assume that any of the wonderful things that these students have done is because of a genetic class that they took with me, right? I mean, there is a certain, <laughs> like already quality of a student who's going to step up and take this kind of class with such a writing component. I mean, there's many other gen ed options. So I think that I can't draw a straight line and say like this student has found success doing this because she took the class, right? But what I can say is I feel like I gave or helped facilitate, right? Like a piece of that intellectual chops that I know is at work and some of their great success. So lots of um, students from this class have graduated and gone on to do great things. And this is just one, but one, but many, I think, pieces of good work. Do you believe there's significance behind like her ending the book with um, the I have a dream speech? I don't think she possibly could have known how that speech would be used, right? Um, and I mean, I just heard it like this week, right? Used by what I call capital P politicians, right? I try to separate capital P politicians from like the lowercase p politics that we all are entrenched in and a part of because they're just this tiny subset of often performative actors. But anyway, um, I don't think that she could have had any idea, right, how that would be used. So I don't think it's fair to say that she, and she's not here, right, and I can't speak for her. I don't think that she could know, but um, I certainly think about that a lot, about the gift in that book to allow me to use her words to help my students understand the way that speech has been misunderstood all the way into the present for sure. Didn't you say it would be like realistic or like chicken away from like her trying to conceive or like showcasing her more like she's not the only one that feels like this? Oh, she's like definitely not the only one who feels like this, right? Like when she says that a lot of people are you know internally snapping and resonating with, with what she has to say. Maybe we have time for one more before we have to go. Um, I It's one more closing comment, which I think is appropriate to end on. Her classes were life-changing for me personally. I know it was for some of my peers too. It helps us approach the world with a different view and gave us the educational cornerstone to learn and talk about critical race theory in much more depth.
And I got an amen in the chat too. Mm -hmm. to the comment. So um, I'm just going to take this opportunity. If you'd like to respond, you can. I just want to say thank you. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know who you are, <laughs> but I love you. I really appreciate that feedback. And I, I don't take it lightly. That just makes me feel like, oh crap, I better, I better continue to do a good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got children. So I'd like to thank everybody here in our live audience. And for those of you joining us via Zoom, that's amazing. If you want to share this, we will have it posted to the Lions High Chat website so you can share it with friends and family. And I'd like to thank Dr. Williams for arranging this and for Dr. Chopper's time and presentation today. So thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.